quick intro. So Daniel, you and I met at the Growth Marketing Conference in San Francisco, right? Correct. And yeah. uh, there you told me that you were gonna travel across the country. You told me a lot of uh, stuff that you could do with email for improving inbox uh, ratings. And today you're gonna talk about automation. You are definitely one of the, the hackier and hustler people that I know. So I'm excited to hear what you have to say and excited that everyone out there can apply this to their own business. So how do we automate a business? All right, guys. Uh, so, you know, one of the things is uh, I've been in uh, email marketing for about 10 years. Uh, I worked for an email marketing service uh, called Benchmark Email. And one of the main things that uh, I've noticed is people get scared when it comes to automations uh, in the sense of like they're, they, they don't know if they have enough knowledge about it. They think that there may be some programming tools in there, uh, which some of them do. But I got to tell you, if you're using an email marketing service that the automation is complicated, go ahead and change because there's a lot of them out there that have really good ones. And what I want to talk about today is the five automations I believe every business needs. If you think about it, uh, if you think about what the life cycle of your customer is, right? They first come to your website, whether it's through SEO, PPC, uh, somebody told them. And then once they're on that site, uh, they have an option to leave or to actually go through, browse through your products and services, uh, and then actually buy, right? Once they buy, you don't want them to just buy once. You want them to come back again and again and again. Uh, and you want to have that cycle uh, in, in a way, never end. So when it comes down to the five automations, uh, the first one that we want to talk about is nurturing a lead, right? When somebody comes uh, to your site, we are all very familiar with that pop-up that shows up, right? Like give us uh, your email in exchange of 10%, uh, free shipping, something like that. For retail, that works really well. Uh, if you are a service and you, know, you can't really just give away 10%, and I actually don't like giving away 10%, I think it devalues the business too quickly. Uh, think of what does add value to your potential customer. Meaning if you're a website designer, you know, you may want to give them like the, the, the top 10 tips uh, to make your website uh, Google friendly, something like that, right? That's something that adds value to them. It gains trust. And it's something that, of course, you can automate. Uh, one of the things that I also like about automation is that it's consistency, meaning if you try to do these kind of things on your own, meaning anytime somebody signs up for that form, you try to manually send the email with your top 10 tip thing, uh, that's not consistency, meaning sometimes you may send it right away. Others, it may take you like uh, 24 hours to send that. So uh, automating a lot of your processes creates a lot of consistency. And by doing that, you're able to also test more, right? Like, is this email going out too quick? Is it taking too long? If you wait 24 hours, is that too long? Especially if it's like a 10 tip thing, people expect those kind of emails right away. Uh, the next automation that I want to talk about, um, I'm sorry. So for the lead nurturing, that's kind of like the, the bait on the, on the fishing pole, right? Uh, here's a, a 10 tips to make your website Google friendly, yada, yada, yada. But then, you know, it takes a little bit more to have somebody actually uh, trust your brand to buy it. Uh, in some cases, it's just that, and they download that, and they want to hire you right away. In others, they still need a little bit of convincing because at the same time, they're probably not just looking at your service. They're shopping around, right? Um, so for that case, the lead nurturing automation, I think, is really important. Um, I think it's between three to 10 emails, uh, depending on the type of service that you provide. As we're giving the example of a website designer, uh, with, what I think is really important is to not just talk about how cool uh, the websites that you can build, but there's a little bit of uh, trust that you have to build as well. Uh, so I think it's really important to talk about yourself, to talk about, you know, kind of like why you started the business, things that you're passionate about. It's a, it's a way to really connect. And don't get me wrong, don't go too far out there. Like, um, but try to bring it back to the business uh, in some ways. But of course, no one likes to be sold. So that's kind of what I'm getting at there with, with, uh, with that. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? Yeah, Daniel, when you say like talk about yourself, it, or do you mean like, you know, telling people about your story of like why you started the company, about the individual, like the, the founders, the brand? Um, is that what you're talking about with your, your onboarding experience or your lead nurturing automation? I am. And one of the main reasons is, 
people buy with emotion. They don't buy with logic. That's, that's a proven fact. Um, you know, people buy things that feel right. So again, I, I really want to emphasize here, don't go too far off and like try to be like best friends. You know, it, it's not like a dating profile or something like that at all. But really tr try to open yourself up more because people will tend to buy through people that they feel good with. Uh, if you're just selling them, sell, 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 that's just kind of like, okay, you know, it's a little too much. But if you try to say, hey, man, I started this business because, you know, I was tired of my nine to five and this is what I'm doing. Here's some examples of the websites. So, again, you try to tie it in and it relates to your, po your potential customer because they started their business. They were tired of their nine to five. So it's that good feeling of like, this guy gets me, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So when you say I you have that. automated response when someone signs up your website and you send them something generic, can you tie that into if you have drift or intercom on your website and someone just asks a generic question, sometimes you, you can't get there to respond to that exact question for 24 hours. What should you send those people? Should you send them something like you're sending the generic leads um, and say that you'll follow up with their more specific question? Absolutely. I think you should always have an answer and set the expectation. Uh, you know, when I go to a site and I, there's a phone number and I try to call and I can't get a hold of someone, I don't know if they're going to get back to me. I don't know. And there's no voicemail. You know, it's just an answering machine that ends with goodbye. And you're like, what? I didn't get my answer. It's very frustrating. And same thing with a chat. If you just get like a chat, I, I think the, the most important thing with somebody coming to your website new looking for information, no matter, no matter what it is, is setting the expectation. If you're not there, how long is it going to take you to get back to me? Is there FAQ that can answer this kind of question? Is there a forum? That kind of stuff. Always think two steps ahead on what your customer is going to want and provide that. That's what, that's what the beauty of automation is. And like I was saying, the consistency that goes with that is if you do one message and 100 people go through that and you realize that the click-through rate is super low they leave the chat right away that's telling you that that's not the right thing to send and you get to change that right so that's one of the main reasons that i like automation is the consistency on being able to test because it always happens the same way for sure that leads into my next question you said um three to ten emails how do you set those up because um to make 10 emails in a row and then find that no one clicks on the first one seems like a waste of time do you make those one at a time and continually add as you see you need more in your funnel or what do you do? Yeah. So for people that know their business really, really well, uh, they'll, they can kind of get a, a better idea as to what they're setting because they've been doing this for so long. Right. So they already know kind of what they've been setting manually, how to put that into a uh, automation. Uh, if you're new starting out your business, yes, I highly recommend to pretty much start one at a time. Uh, and it's the same thing with really anything, right? Like I see some businesses, they just get started and they're like, oh, we got to be on social media. And they open up a Facebook, a Twitter, a Pinterest, a YouTube. It's like, if you're a cupcake shop, what do you, well, why do you have all this? I don't know. I see that the rest of the crowd's doing it. So I got to do it. Always start with what you think is the most important thing and branch off from there, email by email. Uh, and, you know, the, the problem with this too is I see people fluff up a lot. They hear me say like, oh, three to 10 emails and they try to do 10 emails of just like fluff. Uh, don't really send an email unless you, you need something. Meaning, are you looking for an open? Are you looking for a click? Are you looking for them to go to your website? Are you looking for them to buy? Set the goal of the email before you write that email. That's smart. So uh, what's, Daniel, in your recommendation, what do you use as if some a brand new client came to you uh, they were doing a million dollars of years worth of sales and uh, let's see, the, we'll, we'll ask two different questions, the B2B space and the e-commerce space. What tech stacks do you recommend or what do you like to work with? Uh, tech stacks as in software? Yeah. Yeah. So B2B, uh, I love Intercom. I think Intercom is really good. Uh, we were one of their early customers. Uh, their pricing changes monthly, pretty much. I don't know if that's still the case, but they're a really good service. Uh, they allow a lot of automation, and they're so integrated to your website in the sense of, you know, if somebody clicks on link A and goes to this page and doesn't go to this page, send this message. Uh, and I think that's really cool. Uh, and, again, it relates to the 
automation. Uh, when it comes down to, let's say for email marketing, Intercom I think is really good, but I think Intercom is more for kind of like on the site chat. Uh, for email, I think uh, there's better options. Uh, for email marketing, I would suggest, uh, depending on, on the business and how much automation you really want to do, uh, my favorite automation software I would say is Active Campaign. Uh, the, 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 I mean, just the flexibility you have with their software is incredible. Um, aside from that, uh, Benchmark Email, of course, and MailChimp. Those are the, the, the three top email services that I would uh, highly recommend. They're very intuitive and have a lot of automation possibilities. So, uh, I heard Slack, of, so I heard of Active Campaign before. What, and I've heard of MailChimp. What is a Benchmark Email? So Benchmark Email, it's a do-it-yourself email marketing service. Uh, they've expanded to much more than that now. Uh, they actually include CRM and landing page software as well. Interesting. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I've worked with the company for almost uh, 10 years. Uh, and uh, I gotta tell you, the people behind that software, they, they really care. So uh, it's really good. Their, their focus there is being the most intuitive and the easiest to use. That's really their uh, main focus there. So yeah, good option for email marketing. Um, communication, I highly recommend Slack. You know, Skype just doesn't cut it. If you're using Skype, you're in the 90s still, early 2000s. Uh, Slack is the way to go. I mean, it, if you pay, I think it's like five bucks per month per account or something like that. You get the screen sharing, get all that cool stuff. Totally worth it. The Google Drives and the Dropboxes can't go without that. Uh, and I think Zoom, like that. that's all the software you pretty much need. <laughs> oh, great finds. <clears throat> Those are all great, great techs. Yeah. So, you know, um, I don't know how we're doing on time, but I want to make sure uh, to cover uh, two automations that I think a lot of people forget about. Because uh, we all focus on the lead nurturing, trying to make the sale. Uh, we focus on cart abandonment, right? But one of the things that I don't see as much is trying to get feedback from your customers. Uh, you know, and when, whenever a purchase happens, if you have a CRM that goes in there, normally your CRM is connected to your email. So what happens is when somebody makes a purchase, we all want to get that feedback, right? Um, I highly recommend asking for feedback as soon as possible, but you also have to let enough room for your customer to experience your product or service, right? Like if you're a retail store and you're shipping something, don't ask for feedback the next day. They haven't even gotten it, right? Um, so allowing enough time for them to experience your product and your service and then asking for feedback kind of like at the hype. Uh, now, when you ask for feedback with email, what I like to do first is just a simple email, guys. Very simple. It's just say, you know, thank you for your purchase with us we want to improve how did we do and instead of like a 20 minute survey or even a three minute survey don't do that yet they're not committed yet they just want to say it was great or it wasn't so what you do is you put two links on the email one with a smiley face one with a frown face it was great i hated it and what happens is when somebody clicks on it it was great you can automate another email a week from them to then ask for a public review let's say on google on yelp on whatever that is and you do it for the people that are, that are happy customers, right? Because that's what we want to focus on. For those that say, I was dissatisfied, you have an email uh, sent out immediately as they click that from support saying, hey, we heard that you didn't have a good experience. How can we make this better? And I think that is, the main, that is one of the main automations that I've seen have boosted businesses because again, we all focus on word of mouth. And if we have a bad experience, uh, we, we want to be heard. So that kind of covers both of those right there. What do you so use? Is there a, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, what do you use to automate that email with that link? Is that an intercom thing where you just put an intercom link or what tool you do you can use? do it with intercom, uh, active campaign, benchmark email and MailChimp. I think you can do it with all three. For okay. Sure. And then do you have separate email accounts for uh, support versus everything else so that you can you know, hook up who's actually handling support to that email right away and make sure they see it? Absolutely. Uh, what I like to use, I mean, especially for a feedback email like that, uh, you know, I mean, it depends on your team, right? If you're a one-man show and it's you doing it all, uh, then 
I would have that email go right to your inbox. Um, if you have a designated support team, Intercom works really, really, really well. Uh, you can do round robin too, meaning if somebody doesn't pick up the chat right away, it can push it off to the next person. Uh, and I highly recommend that. Gotcha. I want to dive into another question just around uh, images in your emails. I'm assuming because yeah. they already bought something from you, they've you know been on an opt-in list or something and it's going to get delivered. But I've heard a lot around if you include images in your emails, they're a lot less likely to be delivered. Um, do you have any do you have any recommendations for that? Like Absolutely. the smiley face, so, frowny face. Yeah. So with the smiley face, fr uh, frown face, you know, as long as, as long as the images are, are small, uh, and what, what I mean by small is under a hundred ki uh, kilobytes, you should be fine. Your entire email should be under one megabyte. Uh, and again, you know, there are some ISPs that block it. So, you know, remember that, uh, make sure that your emails look good, no matter what, even if the images don't show up, how does your email look? Um, if you can Google this, actually, this is pretty funny. Look up um, transformers email, no images. So with the Transformers movie, when it came out, they sent out a blast and somebody had the idea, said, what happens if, they're, if uh, their images don't load? So click on e uh, images, yeah, right there. And they created this email, scroll down a little bit, Transformer, I think it's maybe Optimus Prime, if you type that in. You'll see how creative they got with this. This was really cool. Oh, it's not gonna show up. Maybe email marketing. There you go, that's the one I think. Oh, they're not gonna show the image, really? <laughs> Come on. Anyway, what they did is they created uh, the whole email using images and they stacked them up in a certain way so the images didn't load you just get the little squares right so they made the optimus prime logo with the missing images of the squares that's awesome so again that shows like how far they went to you know prepare themselves if the images don't load um again if these are people that you're emailing regularly the images i'm not too worried about some isps do block that uh, as long as your email is under one megabyte, you're normally fine. Got I'm going to make sure to find that and I'll send it to you because it's, it's really funny. Uh, awesome. Other things to look at for email deliverability, um, check and see if you are blacklisted. Um, there's a lot of times that people come to me and they don't even know that they've been blacklisted. Um, there is a, a lot of nonprofits uh, that are spam traps. Uh, and pretty much what happens is when you don't use your email for more than two years, the ISPs like Google or Hotmail, they give those emails to uh, these nonprofits to just monitor the type of emails that are coming through. Because this email hasn't been used in over two years, if you sign up to something with that, it shows that that's probably not, that was an unauthentic sign up. Uh, so what they do for that is they try to put these emails out in public to uh for scrapers to get those put it on a list sell it and that's normally where you get a spam trap when you send to a, a purchase rented or third-party harvested list uh there's high chances of uh, spam traps being in there because that's what they're for they're they're, they're 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 trying to catch that bad behavior um so check and see if you are blacklisted uh, if you just google blacklisting ips you'll see some of the services there that you can do it for free uh, and then if you are blacklisted, most of the uh, programs have uh, ways to, you know, delist yourself. You, you have to prove your business and all these other things. Uh, it takes some time. It is nonprofit, but uh, that's, that's the way to do it. Um, aside from that, if you ever get a uh, blacklisting that you have to pay to be delisted for, normally it's not worth it. Uh, check on forms and things like that but a lot of them just try to do it to make some cash and they're not that important. Meaning the ISPs don't value their blacklisted list as much as they would have uh, the real nonprofit ones.
So we had a question from the uh, audience about SendGrid and, and how is SendGrid and deliverability for SendGrid? SendGrid I've heard is one of the best email marketing services for email deliverability. Um, I'm pretty sure they even have it set up to where you, they just have servers and you can use your own software. Uh, you send all of your emails through API. Um, so from my experience, uh, SendGrid has had the best delivery. That's, a, that's excellent. Uh, I just want to ask a question. Uh, uh, Daniel, uh, great information so far. Really, really helpful. Uh, so we're, we're a SaaS business, so we're really focused on um, transactional emails and kind of uh, integrating that with also kind of the, the newsletter sending and the follow-up email. Have you worked with any SaaS businesses in this respect? And kind of can you talk about how the kind of stacks work together um, in regards to like using SendGrid with MailChimp? or even like kind of combining different uh, mail services together? Absolutely, so you know, what I see, uh, you know, a lot of, and MailChimp has Mandrill, which is their transactional, right? Um, but I do see a lot of people use SendGrid for transactional email, uh, something like MailChimp for email marketing and announcements and things like that. And then they use like Intercom for support. So that's normally the, the main trio that I see. Um, and how they work together, I mean, they all have integrations with themselves that, that, uh, normally is, uh, how I would do it. But, uh, yeah. Do you have like a, a specific question? Um, that was mainly it. Like, uh, we're kind of learning, all right, we're using SendGrid for transactional emails, but you know, when people are onboarding, you know, um, I guess for kind of like certain drip campaigns that could fall more into SendGrid as, and then you kind of, you know, if someone opts into newsletter, all the newsletter sending would just come from MailChimp. Um, cause there's still, cause I, I used to run some e-commerce things and what's cool about MailChimp yeah. is you set up the, uh, you know, those automated, you just bought something and, and send this. So it's kind of like, uh, I'm, right now I'm learning how to kind of integrate both where, where the handoff is for SendGrid as where, you know, some things for MailChimp should, um, take over, but you're saying, yeah. uh, and I haven't even looked into this, like kind of the APIs, uh, that work together between them, you can kind of better uh, see which one is is uh, is going to be a better fit. Totally. The, I mean, the thing is, is I, I highly suggest using the least amount of software. So you yeah. know, if you can combine <laughs> them, uh, do that. Uh, and again, no, if you're using Mailchimp, knowing that they have Mandrill, I've heard it's pretty darn good. Um, I would cancel off a of SendGrid and use just Mailchimp. Now, there's also a good bit about it, especially for email marketing. If one of those services has an issue, meaning, you know, uh, you hit a spam trap or something like that, you still have the other one to rely on. So mm. there is pros and cons to using multiple services too. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't looked into uh, Mandrill. Um, I, I've looked at a uh, mail gun and kind of like looking more into transactional email uh, services, but wasn't really uh, familiar with uh, Mandrill. I mean, if you really think about it, MailChimp, last uh, time I checked the stat, they send about 25% of all the emails. That's wow. insane. Yeah, that's nuts. That is insane. It's like so, the word, WordPress of uh, email. <laughs> yeah, so if you think about it, uh, the ISPs are very familiar with the MailChimp domains and their uh, servers. So you're already a, a step ahead with that. Um, aside from that, as long as you have good practices, you should be in the clear. And Using SendGrid, again, I think they pretty much set up dedicated servers for you. Gotcha. Cool. Uh, I'll, I'll look more into that. Thanks. Awesome. Let me know if you have any other questions. Yeah. So, so Daniel, um, I love asking this question. You're, you're an expert in the customer journey. You're an expert in, in email marketing, transactional emails, automating the customer journey. What's the thing that excites you most in terms of like, uh, a technology or a hack or, or a process or something that you saw that you were a customer a part of and you're like, wow, they did awesome at that. Um, I think the puzzle piecing, um, again, you know, when you think about automation, you always have to think of the goal ahead of time and then you kind of have to work your way backwards. So I really, really enjoy experiencing an automation that's spot on. That's there. Like a good example Amazon, when you leave something and you don't go back for it, they don't send it to you 24 hours later, an hour later, something's in your cart. They send that to you on Friday because they know you just got paid 
and that's the best time <laughs> to send it. So things like that, when it, it's just so spot on, it, it just feels right, you know? Or, you know, when you're going through a site, and you're like, this is confusing. And they have intercom sets. So like if somebody's on this page for more than 10 minutes, have the pop-up show up then. Not, a, not 30 seconds in, you know? So things like that, I, I, I really, that's what I guess sparks joy in me. And, and that's the passion I have about marketing. And I just love when it's done right. <laughs> Awesome. I like the, the pop-up coming in like halfway through, like I'm about to click on the next button and the pop-up shows up. It's annoying, but if I'm stuck there and I'm reading that, that's, that's really good feedback. That's a, like a really good, like little tip and trick there. Yeah. I mean, really put yourself in the shoes of your customers. Don't just follow what you hear in a webinar and things like that. Like take everything with a grain of salt. And that's the thing about marketing. When you hear a marketer say I'm an expert, uh, he's probably not. But when you hear somebody say, I'm an experienced marketer, I don't really know your business, but let's get to know it. That's who you pretty much want because they're, cause really every business is different. And if I, if I do the same tricks that I did with, you know, John, I do with you, you guys are pretty much doing the same business. That's, that's, you're competing directly with each other. I, my job is to try to figure out, okay, how can, what is your story and how can we tell that better than anyone else? You don't want to be a me too. You want to be on a table of one is what you want. Right. There's a, a great thing where you can say like, I'm the best in the world at video, which is a large audience. I'm the best in the world at voice, which is a large audience. But as soon as you say I'm the best in the world at video and voice, it's a very small audience. Exactly. And you get the, you, you get your true fans. I think uh, Seth Godin said that you only need a thousand true fans to make a living. That means anything that you push out, they're going to buy it. A thousand true fans. That's all you need to have a comfortable living. Well, let's get there. Um, also, <laughs> Daniel, we're great on time. Um, we've got 25 more minutes. I don't know how many uh, automations you've gotten through, but this is a great conversation. If you have more, um, feel free to take the conversation as long as you'd want. Absolutely. So going back to the cart abandonment, uh, just really quick. Uh, so the cart abandonment is the automation I think everyone starts with. Uh, they either do the pop-up with the coupon and then they go right to the cart abandonment. Uh, it's a really important automation. Uh, the biggest thing that I would say is like when to send that. Like I was saying, put yourself in your customer's shoes. Uh, Amazon, they wait till Thursday, you know, cause they know that you get paid on Friday. So Thursday, Friday, that's when that email goes out. Uh, think of it as well. Like if you're, if it's like, let's say that you sell uh, pet food, right? Uh, somebody that buys a bag of pet food, you may want to calculate, okay, how long is it really going to take for that bag to be empty? Is it 28 days? So on, on day 25, your email should be going out. Hey, 10% off your next bag of uh, dog food, something like that. So I think, you know, beyond the cart abandonment, it's the recurring purchase as well. How do you get them to come back? You don't want to annoy your customers with never ending emails. And that's why I think it's so important to get yourself really in their shoes and say, okay, if this bag of food is going to be out, you know, in 28 days and they're going to need one a couple of days before, you know, so they're not buying it as the food comes out, you figure out exactly when you need to send that uh, email. So I'm not going to tell you like, oh, make sure to send their email within 24 hours or this or that, because again, for every business is slightly different. How does that relate to products like SaaS products that are, you know, you pay for them monthly you maybe make the conscious choice to continue paying for them. You maybe forget and you just continue to pay for them. Should you be reminding people, you know, before they're going to pay for it of the value of it, if they're not continuing to use it or should you not in hopes that they continue to pay for it and don't think about it? So that's a really funny question. Um, and here's a funny story for you. Every time we would send out our newsletter for benchmark email, that was when we had the most amount of cancellations in the month. Because it's exactly what you're saying. There's some people that would sign up, forget about it, and they would, they would get the newsletter and be like, oh, yeah, I, I've been meaning to cancel that. They would go and cancel it. Um, I don't like to be shady. I don't like to play tricks. Uh, I actually like when a business is honest and just trying to help me out and save me money. It, it, you know, even if I don't use it now, I will come back to this business because they treated me well. Uh, I think it's like Slack, right? Slack, they look at how many users log in for the month 
And if, you know, five people haven't logged in, they don't charge you for those five people, even though their accounts are active and they could have. Mm. Uh, I think that's really, really good uh, business. Um, so, you know, if you're on a monthly subscription, uh, you know, you normally send a receipt out, right? Because when they renew, uh, even if it's automated. So for that, I highly recommend, like you said, explain the value. Remind people what other customers like you are doing with your software. Uh, things like that really goes a long way because there's some people that they just don't have the time. You know, I mean, look at your habit how you wake up, you eat breakfast, the things that you do, it's really hard for a business to kind of get in there to be part of your habit. Uh, but the more that you can entice them with value, I think it, 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 it will work out. And like I said, I don't like the businesses that are quiet and be like, no, don't send out a receipt. They, you know, they're, they're, they'll see it on their credit card. I see that. That's kind of just shady. That's good advice. That's actually really good advice. Um, my second part to my question for that is, uh, when you're onboarding someone, uh, how would you set up your 14 day trial email such that you email them enough to provide enough value that when it comes to that first payment, they want to pay, but you don't email them so much that they're just like, these people are just trying to get something out of me. I need to run. Yeah. So again, uh, content, content is king in this day and age. Um, and it's not just, let me show you how to use my software. It's let me show you how to grow your business. And oh, by the way, we're going to use my software. That's how it works. Uh, your customer is the, is the hero here, not your business. Your business, okay, there's a really good book I highly recommend. It's called uh, St uh, Brand Story, Story Brand? Story Brand. Uh, it's written by uh, David Miller, I think his name is. Um, it's an incredible book that talks about how to uh, relate your business as a Hollywood movie. I know that sounds crazy. But hear this out. This guy, he explains that every Hollywood movie has a specific formula to it, where there's a main character, the main character is minding his own business, and something happens, something tragic, uh, and it changes his life, and he has to do something about it. Along the way, he meets a guide. This guide kind of helps him out, puts him on track. Think of it as kind of like Luke Skywalker meeting Yoda. Yoda was his guide, right? Um, and then at the end of the movie, he's transformed and he's a better person, right? So this is the same thing with your business. Your customer is the hero. You're Yoda. You're just there to guide him through, but you need to make sure that everything is prepared for his success, not yours. Uh, and I highly recommend this book. I'm telling you story brand. It will change how you market entirely. Uh, your customer first, not your business. No one cares about your business. Sorry to say. In a way, they care about their business and growing it. And if your tool is going to help them on your lead generation automation, automation, sorry, focus on that. Focus on how you can help grow their business. That's great advice. I'm going to read that book now. Chills, man. I like that is like so far the line of this whole entire thing is everything should be angled for your customer success, not yours. You are Yoda. Absolutely. <laughs> I want to be Yoda. Yeah. yeah and Think about it. If your customers are successful, you will. That's just how it is. People will talk about it. They're, they'll share your stuff. And when That's it comes deep. down to an email stream, add that value. Show cool things that people have done with your software. That's what they want to see. For sure. Case studies. What do you do at the beginning yeah. when um, you're just launching your product and maybe you don't have case studies? You just show your own case studies? How you use it to get yep. to the customer yeah, you're talking Joe, to? Yeah, actually, I'm making a course uh, about these five automations. And the funny thing about this course is kind of like an inception thing where I'm showing you the email marketing I'm building for the course on the course. So as I'm teaching you to do a lead generation automation, I'm teaching you the one that you're going through as you sign up through the course. Yeah, we, we used a campaign like that where we used our own tool and then people would reach out to us and say, so what, what are you going to do for my business? And it was nice to say, you just experienced exactly what it is we're going to do. Yeah, that's cool. But that's yeah, awesome. I mean, uh, that's pretty much it. Unless you guys have uh, questions, I'm wide open for it. All right. I got, I got a question kind of comment. We're going to open it up to the floor a little bit. I got this, uh, this message on LinkedIn today. It said, 
is that, hey, uh, salespeople and marketers, if you want to have the subject lines decrease and reply rates decrease by 40%, uh, just put in COVID and coronavirus in the subject line and you're going to have nobody uh, open your email or reply to your email. And their, their N was 1 million emails that they sent to, to prove this and show this. Uh huh. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting. Uh, it's kind of like the whole GDPR thing when every, every email, my, my dentist was sending me emails about GDPR and I'm like, why are you sending me emails about GDPR? We got a, I got a COVID email from uh, like MGM, like telling me about how to protect from COVID and coronavirus. It's um, ridiculous. Yeah. Tacking, uh, tacking on to that, uh, are there any like huge like red flags, do not ever do this in email subject lines or in the email that can really turn people off that you've seen? Here's the thing, you know, when it's, when it's something serious, guys, like whether you believe that it's a problem or not, there are people that are dying. And when you're taking advantage of that for your business, that's kind of messed up. Um, you know, I, I, like, I like what you guys are doing. Things like this, you know, people are in home, there's conferences that got canceled. You know what? Hey, let's do this online that's freaking awesome. You're adding value in a moment. Like that, that's awesome. Um, but when you're, when you're latching on to an epidemic to grow your business, that's, that's, that's just bad. So, I, I mean, this is a personal thing, right? I wouldn't do it. Um, again, I think as long as you're adding value, do it. Uh, at the growth marketing conference that we met, there was somebody talking about uh, black Friday and what they could do. They were like a, Nova ring, you know, like a, like a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it's like a female condom. I forget exactly what it was, but anyway, yeah, they were trying to figure out, right. like, what do they send out for like a Black Friday? Like, they don't want to send out like a deal or a special, like, it's, it just felt weird, right? Uh, so what they decided to do, though, is every purchase that happened on Black Friday, they were donating to uh, Planned Parenthood or something like that. And I thought that was really, really cool. So it's a way to still be part of, I guess, the, the trend, but not being salesy and making a fool out of your business, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Where is the line, though, where, um, you know, everyone thinks that every other business is being socially responsible and sending out this email. So it's their duty to send out this email versus where you think this company is taking advantage of it. Yeah, I think if you again, if you're adding value, that's that's where the line is value to your customer meaning you know i i seeing email marketing services send out an email about covid right it's like you're an email marketing service i don't go to your store i don't interact with you why are you sending out now when the email says hey guys if our phone calls are taking longer we're short on staff because of the virus okay that kind of email makes sense but don't try to sell me a discount now that you know covid's on <laughs> that completely makes sense that that this and therefore this about our business it's a message exactly. it's a public service announcement about how you're going to interact with them not just about the environment at large exactly like again as an email service you really have nothing to do with the virus but if you're telling me that your you know your support hours are reduced uh you know no sales okay that makes sense thank you now i know you're setting the expectation So a question for you, if you believe in what we're doing right now in educating people while they're home, um, oh, I had this conversation with you earlier, but there's a lot of college students at home that can educate themselves before their job start. There's a lot of uh, people that work remotely across the country that can't travel who are educating themselves. Um, if you believe in what we're doing, do you know anyone else who uh, would want to speak? Uh, absolutely, actually. Uh, I know quite a few people. Um, let me get back to you on that. Cool. Would their goal be to make up for speeches that they would have done elsewhere in person? Or is it the type of people um, where any opportunity to speak online is something that they jump at? I would say a little bit of both. Would you find that about most speakers in marketing? Like most speakers in marketing want to get their brand awareness out there? Um, I think so. I mean, I think it's the best way to. Uh, do this you know it, it it's something that um if people see what like this call here right if people like what i had to say if they you know if they find value 
and what I have to say, they're likely to want to speak with me more, maybe even hire me for something. So I think all marketers kind of have that in mind. Uh, it's, it's a way of networking. Would you recommend that other people start live streams like this in this uh, current environment? Or would you Absolutely. recommend that they, would it be better for their business to do that? Or would it be better to band together with multiple people so that you have consistency of content? Um, I think both. I think, you know, doing your own and doing, uh, you know, co-hosted helps a lot, especially, you know, because you get two audiences that go for the live session and then there's a lot of crossover that, that happens. Are you going to start one? Am I going to start one? Sorry, I, I, I didn't hear that part. Yeah, that was it. Are you, would you start one yourself? Or I thought about it. I, I actually have. Uh, the problem that I have is, um, I guess, especially in the situation that I'm at, I, I guess this would be cool. But for those of you that don't know, uh, I'm, uh, it was originally being a three month road trip across the country. Uh, looking for the coolest people to know in every city and have them uh, on a podcast. Now it's going to turn into a never-ending trip because the only reason we were going back was for a music festival that got canceled. So I have no reason to go home. So we're just going to keep traveling. Um, so I guess that's I guess it's amazing. what I saw is like the issue that, you know, it's hard to kind of go through this, but I think it's the best way to do it. So you guys may have inspired me to really get this going. <laughs> you should. I mean, the if you can find the coolest people you know and convince them to go on camera for five minutes, I think that would be an amazing thing that I would watch where everybody wants to see how other people are living their lives, but like actually living their lives as opposed to on TV. And I would tune in. Yeah. All right. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> cool. All right, Daniel. So where do you go for news, tips and tricks, community information and in this, marketing customer journey what are what are your go-to's uh honestly everything is changing so much um i like uh what's the journal uh seo journal i like that one a lot uh that it's not just seo you learn a lot about marketing with with how the seo works as well uh the thing that i like to do most is when i read a book what other books are recommended in that book and that's how i kind of keep my streamline going Got it. All right. So top two books other, other than uh, uh, story brand, what other books do you recommend? Uh, who there's marketing to the mind States that one read it right after story brand because it, it connects really well. The guy that wrote marketing to the mind States loves story brand uh, because it, it's, it kind of, it adds the missing pieces that story brand has. Story brand sets you up to write the story. Marketing to the mindsets makes you fill the details of that story. Really good. And then another book, uh, if you're starting a business and want to get organized, um, get a grip, get a grip. That one, uh, that one teaches you how pretty much 90% of all businesses don't have it together. Uh, but this is how to do it. Uh, and it's really, really good how they set up, you know, your 10 year goal, your five year, your three year. Cause some people, they don't even think 10 years. From now and i'm not saying that it has to be perfect but this book gives a really good kind of like explanation to set you up for success and to realize if you're not on track or if you are it's really easy because right now i bet you i can ask a bunch of businesses are you on track and then be like i think so i don't know they don't really have it clear they don't have it clear who they are what their message is they're just selling coffee or something like that and that's not really a business mm. Interesting. All right. I heard you say talk Seth Godin earlier. What's your favorite yes. Seth Godin book? Uh, his latest one. Uh, all, no, it's not his latest one. Uh, all marketers are liars. I love that book. Nice. I haven't read that one yet. I, I've read like two or three of his books. But that's great. I'm going to check that one out. Yeah. And then uh, one for the, just one more, your brain at work. That one is a really good book in which they explain how your brain works. Uh, it's kind of like when you're happy, this is what's happening in your brain. When you're sad, this is what's happening. Uh, when you're stressed, this is what's happening. So what it does is when you know what's happening in your brain, I think it's much easier to manage it. Uh, and it teaches you a lot about time management as well. When you get to work, first thing, we all go to our emails, right? It's the worst thing. 
to do because it sucks up a lot of uh, brain power and you need that to make other decisions. Uh, if you look at Mark Zuckerberg, he always wears the same clothes. The reason being is we can only make so many decisions per day. So he wants to save that by not even having to choose what to wear. That's how like focused this guy is. Dang. Okay. When the store is open, I'm buying six of the same pair of jeans. <laughs> cool. So we don't have that much time left. So this has been really, really helpful. Where can people find you online so they can learn more about you, your journey, and what you're doing? Yeah. Uh, you guys can find me on LinkedIn. If you search for Daniel Miller, followed by Benchmark Emo. I think that's the easiest way to find me. I'm no longer with Benchmark, but uh, it's a company that I've worked for for almost 10 years. Uh, so there's a lot of content out there with that. Um, aside from that, you can follow us actually on our Instagram. Uh, the coolest people we know, as we mentioned, uh, we're going cross country, looking for the coolest people to know in every city and having them on a podcast. So uh, you can find us on Instagram and on all the major podcasts, such as uh, Spotify, Apple, Google One. And who, do you, who are you looking for that if they reached out to you, they could help you with what you're doing? Uh, really, we're looking for people that are genuine. That's, that's who we're really finding that the pattern is of the coolest people. Uh, it's people that they're, they're, they're doing what they love, no matter what it is. Uh, it's not about money. It's not about fame. It's not about anything, but just doing what they love. If they happen to make money and fame with that, then that's great. But you can really see these genuine people. Uh, we were in Page, uh, Page Arizona, uh, a couple of weeks ago, beautiful city. Uh, and we met, uh, uh, this teacher that spring break was about to start and he was giving us all this advice as to what to do. And he's talking about how he takes his students out and this, you could tell this guy had passion for what he does. Uh, and on top of that, he took the, re the rest of the week to his time to take us out on really cool hikes, showing us cool places. And again, just how genuine it all was. We had to have somebody like him on our podcast. So yeah, we invited him. I think he'll be our fifth episode. So far, there's only one out. Um, but yeah, anybody we'll that's genuine and doing cool stuff. <laughs> Gotcha. And are you finding them yourselves? Or when you say those are people you'd like to meet, are you taking recommendations from uh, the ether where someone says, oh, you're going through this town, you have to meet X, Y, Z? Oh, absolutely. Actually, if you go to our uh, website, thecoolestpeoplewenow.com, uh, there's a form there and you can see our map there. Uh, and if anybody knows based on the map what we're doing, if anybody knows anybody in those cities, please let us know. We'd love to talk to them. Okay, we'll put that map up and see who the coolest people we know are so that we can make them yes. the coolest people you know. Would love that. Cool. Thank you, Daniel. This was great content. Um, this is the first format that we've done where we've interviewed someone and both your presentation and your ability to be interrupted was amazing. Jake, thank you for asking questions and everyone who participated. Um, we're thank just going to you wrap. You're welcome. We're gonna wrap it up in the last five minutes. Uh, Daniel, you're welcome back anytime as we continue to grow our audience. If there's some more cool people that you wanna talk about or if you wanna talk about uh, more marketing stuff. Um, yeah, that's what we've got. Awesome, uh, well, thank you guys very much. You're welcome. Enjoy the rest of your trip across the country.